So today I'm going to show you a good little Python project whereby I use some basic image process processing skills and some sort of interrogation uh, of an image to solve uh, mazes and potentially labyrinths as well. So this can be applied to any kind of uh, type of maze that you like, um, but graphically it needs to be um, relatively simple. So I'll show you an example of what I mean. Um, but if it has a like, ri very rich image, for example, like a garden or something like that with a maze in it, then this approach on its own won't work. But for actually solving the maze in a simple image form, form, form it, this will work fine. So first thing we're going to do is import the libraries that we need. So I know that we're going to do quite a bit of plotting. So I'm going to import matplotlib pylab. And I like to import it as plt for convenience. And then mostly I'll be programming a lot of stuff from scratch so you can see it. But this is one function from the S scikit image library that I will make my life a lot easier. And it's called skeletonize. And I'll talk about what that will do later. And then this might be done automatically, but I always like to import numpy as mp. If all that stuff loads, um, then we're ready to go. If any of this stuff doesn't load, then you'll have to install those packages. If you've got JupyterLab like me, then you should be fine for matplotlib and, and numpy, but um, you might have to install, install sci, um, kit image morphology, um, which is uh, done with pip, but I'll put a link in the description about that. So first thing I'm going to do is take a look at the image and give you an idea of the type of uh, structure of images that can be solved using this. And I've already copied it in to my directory. So that's right. Yeah. So uh, this is from Wikipedia and it's uh, free to use, um, but I will um, put a, a link in the description to the source. And so you have an idea of the copyright, um, but as long as I cite the origin, um, then it's, it's fine to use. So I'm just going to plot this now. I'm going to make it quite big using the fig size argument of figure um, so that we can have a good look at it. And I'm going to show you the image. So here you can see. What I mean by simple um, image is just that it's essentially black and white or grayscale. Um, there's no sort of hedges or anything like that. If we wanted to do something like that, we'd have to do use more advanced segmentation, which we can do in another example. But the real aim of today is how do I get from the beginning to the end and how do I do it as efficiently as possible? And um, how do I go about tackling that task using image processing and, and image analysis, essentially. So that's what we'll do. And what I have to do as part of this is basically define the um, the start location and the stop location. Um, the algorithm doesn't know where we want to get to or where we're starting. So I will approximate this um, by looking at the scale of the image. So the start is here, as far as I'm concerned. And that should be all right. And then I'm going to define the um, the end, which is the middle. And I think about yes, something like six fifty. Six fifty. And just um, for convenience, I'm defining two variables um, in each line here. So the x coordinate and the y coordinate for the start and the end. And we can have a look at this. I'm going to make the start, I'm going to make it green. So we put in x and y coordinate, and then g, and then I put in an x so it'd be a green cross. And then I'll make the marker size a bit bigger than the default so that we can see it nice and clearly. And then for the endpoint, I will choose a red cross. Why not? or a red X even. And then again, the marker size 14. Then I'll add that 
<laughs> so here we can see the start is here and uh, the end is here, which is fine with what we want to do. And yeah, that's our starting point. So I want to get from this X, from this green cross even, to this red cross, this red X, um, as efficiently as possible. So how do we go about tackling that task? Well, although this is a almost a binary image, it is in fact a grayscale, and we can easily see that by taking a look at the the min and the well the max value of the RGB image. I reckon it will be 255. Yeah, so the intensities between here are spread between zero and 255. Um, they're probably pretty much just those two possibilities in this image, as in it's not using the full range for any reason. Um, if we use bin count, we can see how many pixels we have. So, uh, okay, so we just have to check one channel at a time. Or even, uh, let's just reshape it. Just like it's one dimension. Oh, so we do actually have a variety of intensities, but just a sprinkling. The main ones are in the first packet, which represents zero in this case, and the last is the max. But yeah, there's noise essentially, or it's the result of the um, compression algorithm that it's no longer zero and uh, 255 only. But this kind of works anyway. So what we want to do is uh, threshold this image. And the way in which we do that is we're going to do a very simple thresholding. We're just going to say that in our image, we just need one of the channels. So this is an RGB image, but you can see it's just black and white, really. And I, I feel like we're not going to lose any information by just taking one of those channels. So here, this is the... Uh, the rows, this is the columns, and this is the, the channels. So if we were to do, um, for example, print RGB image shape, you can see the actual size of the image. And yeah, so this is the, the rows, the columns, and then this is the, uh, the number of channels. So by indexing zero, we're just going to take the first one. And then what we want to do is we want to apply a very simple threshold to this. So I'm going to do that here by just saying anything above 128, it's going to be positive, and everything below that will be negative. Okay, so that's worked just fine. And then I'll just show you what that looks like, but it, this is now a binary image. And this is just how um, the matplotlib library um, colors um, sort of single channel images. It has like a, a jet color scale. So we can actually change that by putting in something else. Um, so this is it's gray, is correct? I might have to look this up. Is it CM grays? Yeah, I have forgotten. But we can just quickly go to map plot lib C map colors. Just want to show you what a different color map looks like. It doesn't actually change the uh, the information. It just show, changes the the mapping of the of the intensity values to colors for display. So yeah, so this is might might be what you'd more likely expect to see. But really, the same information has been shown with the default color map. Um, it's just um, diff different colors. But this is now a threshold image. If we repeated what we did before with bin count, we can see that it will now be just two values. To reshape it so it's a linear array for this. And yeah, you can see zero, this many values, and one, this many values. And that's exactly what we want. For basic kind of morphology analysis, for like image um, analysis, um, binary images are much easier to apply algorithms to. Um, just because it's much more simple and within the realms of sort of binary um, inter interpretation. Um, so we can run algorithms very fast and it's very simple to interpret for the computer. So this is our thresholded image. And what we're going to do now 
is we want to create a skeleton image. So it's probably a good idea if I just show you what this is and then try and explain it. So this is the function that we imported from our scikit image library. And again, what I'll do is I'll make it quite large using the figure and the fixed size argument, 14 by 14. And then let's have a look. So this is the result of what we've done. Essentially, what it has done is from the, what are the white pixels here in our thresholded image, it's basically worked out the kind of medial axis and sort of the, the most um, limited amount of pixels that represent this white space. So basically it erodes it until there's only one pixel left um, throughout the throughout its length in any of these directions. And so what this has done is it's made our possibilities for traversing the maze much more simple. It still represents all of the, the routes, but rather than it being these thick, thick bits of corridor, it's just reduced it down to a single pixel width. So this just allows us to do our processing much more efficient. And this is typically called a skeleton, as in, which is like, you know, our skeleton represent our sort of most simple and condensed sort of form. So if you take away all the flesh and the muscle, you're just left with the skeleton. And that's kind of what we've done here. Okay, so this is what we're going to work on. And then we want to create our sort of map of, of routes. So this is uh, what we'll be working on quite a bit. But what it represents is just our inverted skeleton image at this point. Um, so what this symbol here means is uh, not essentially it's gonna anything that's uh, true will become positive and true will become negative and vice versa our ones become, will become zeros and our zeros will become ones so uh, if I just plot that it, you'll see just it's just inverted the image because I want um, the path to actually be zero and the rest of the um, the image to be um, uh, ones. So you can see that is now inverted. Okay, and I'll just show you also where our start and uh, end locations will be located on this just to show you a problem which I think we're going to have, which is, although we've generated these very specific paths, our points that we've defined, because we did it kind of roughly, won't actually fall exactly on one of these paths. And the problem with that is we want to follow these paths, and I spelled marker size wrong. We want to follow these paths and um, if they don't fit, if they don't, if I haven't placed them directly on the actual path, then it won't know exactly where to start and stop. So somehow we want to go from here to our path so that it can it can actually uh, follow it. Okay, so we have to solve a problem, which is just finding which part of the path is nearest our start and, and end point. Okay, so with that in mind. What we're now going to do is start sort of working on our algorithm and for that I'm just gonna because we're gonna need to run it quite a few times and we're also gonna change this I'm actually just going to uh, make a copy of our um, of our map tracks uh, image so this uh, underscore map T means essentially it's just uh, it's limited um, it's just a, a type of nomenclature which shows to me that it's a sort of temporary copy which we're going to change and then discard, whereas map T is the sort of copy that we might go back to if we rerun the code. It means I don't have to keep running this this uh, cell if I make a mistake or something here. So now we want to come up with a way of um, searching for... Um, basically, we'll start from the end point rather than the beginning point. Um, so when we're doing this, we start from the end and, and work back. So we're going to search for our 
um, endpoint and connect to the path. And we're going to search about, I think, uh, 30 pixels as a possibility in any direction. Our image is quite high resolution, so 30 pixels isn't really that much. And what we want to do is basically from our selected point, we want to search within 30 pixels and try and find our nearest point of our path. And that will be our real kind of starting point in terms of the algorithm. So I want to find within this neighborhood the y and x points where map t minus our sort of search radius um, up until our point and the search radius. So we're kind of making a square around our um, selected point. So we want to know all of the points within there, which are equal to zero. So remember our path is now defined as zero. And this will show us all of the points within 30. It's not really a radius because it's a square, but you get the idea. Within this search zone, we want to find the nearest point, uh, or in this case, all of the points which are, are zero. And then because we've created a subregion of our image here, these points won't be in the context of the original image. So we're just going to uh, calibrate points to main scale again. So for that, we just simply add our origin of our little neighborhood back onto those points. So if you don't get this, it's fully understandable, but try it without <laughs> and you'll see what happens. Essentially, because we've just defined a little region here, the values we get out of here will be indexed from zero, but really we want them in the context of the main image. So we're adding this value, which was the bottom of our range to the values that come out of here. So these will be like zero up to um, uh, 60 but we want it in the original image. So we have to add like 300 or whatever this origin was. Okay, so now we find all of the possibilities of the nearest points. We want to find the closest one. So that should be the end points. And for this, I'm going to do just a little bit of um, Pythagorean theorem, um, which is we want to find the square root of our opposite and adjacent. Um, so we want to find the hypotenuse, which is represents the closest distance between our two points, or the, what is known as the Euclidean distance as well. So CPYS and CPXS are vectors. So this is actually processing quite a few things simultaneously. Y1 and X1 is a single point, and we take that off the, these two lists, square them, so we get the sort of absolute, and then square root it to get back into the, the range of our original. Well, we don't actually need to do that, but yeah, why not? because we're just finding the minimum of all of those. So it's important to square it because we don't want negative values. But um, once we've squared it, we don't actually need to know the distance specifically. We just need to know which was smallest, but I'll leave it in there. Um, but yeah, just so you know. And then um, we just want those values. We want, sorry, the argmin part of here just finds us the minimum one. And then we want to know what the actual um, coordinates of that were, was. And so we do that by indexing our two arrays um, with the discovered index from our argmin. So argmin doesn't find you the minimum 
value, it finds you the index of the of the minimum value. And then we just put that in to get our um, actual start point or the start point for the algorithm processing, but actually what represents the, the nearest bit of the path to our endpoint here. And so essentially, Missed the bracket here, and we get that back. It says we've got too many indices. Hmm. Oh, it's up here. Oh, I put a comma there rather than a colon. Okay, so all the bugs found, and then so our y and our x. We found our actual start point or the start point for our, where we're going to start our processing. And I'm just going to, I want to plot that. So I'm just going to add an extra one here, which I'll remove afterwards and just show you where that marker lands. And you can see just this little red dot here. This is the nearest bit of the path. So you can see that's what we've just calculated. So once we're on the path, we can then start processing and, and going around our maze, hopefully. So I just noticed actually that it doesn't look like this path is actually connected, but I think that's just because it's a very thin path and the it doesn't show up very well at the resolution. So I'm just going to have a, another quick look at it, but at a much bigger size. And yeah, we can see it does actually connect up to the rest of the path. So phew, I don't have to worry about that. That was just a plotting issue. There's a certain resolution and if it's just one or a few pixels, it might be lost as it down samples. But yeah, it's all fine. So you can play around with the fig size if you have that problem as well. And now what I want to do is um, set up my um, first kind of um, searching algorithm. So I know where to start now, and I want to create a few lists. So I'm going to use points x to be my x points. So this is going to grow and shrink as we move around, um, as we find points to analyze and see if we should go in that direction or not. And then this is our, so we've got the x and y lists, but this is c. So this is going to represent our intensity and the, um, the original, the initial intensity or rather distance is um, zero. So our starting point, which is our end of the maze, is uh, going to be defined as zero. And then this might not seem immediately obvious why I want to do this, but I want to create a mesh of, dis of displacements. So this is um, a way of um, simplifying the exploration of the immediate neighborhood of each point. So we're going to take our point and then we're going to look at its neighbors and see um, where we should go. And one way of doing that is to create a mesh grid, not a mesh, not a mesh grid, mesh grid, and create a three by three neighborhood uh, with it. So basically, this goes minus one, zero, one as a three by three grid, and this basically gives us the coordinates that we need when we're exploring around each point. It's just a little simple way of doing it. And I'm going to linearize them to um, put it in the format that I think I'll be using. And one more thing is I want to create a sort of distance image where I will log and display the discovered distances from the origin of the path. I want this to be the same shape as our thresholded image. So this is just a quick way of defining that. And then, yeah, we're going to start our algorithm. So this is a actually uh, a breadth first um, algorithm for exploring uh, a tree. <laughs> so what this means is that we're not just going to try and go as deep as we can 
down a particular route. We can explore each possibility, each of these branches, and then keep going along the shortest route until we get to the end. So I'll visualize um, more what that what that actually means. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a nice way of of, of doing it, um, which will find us the optimum route, even if there are loops and things in the in the algorithm. So we'll start by creating a loop. So while true, so this will keep running unless we have the break statement. And first thing that we're going to do within it is um, update our count or our update distance. It's probably better. IDC maybe. So we want to know what the smallest distance is in our current list of searched items. So again, this may not make much sense until we get to the end of the loop, because at the moment we only have one distance, but later on we'll have multiple entries. And we always want to start with the lowest distance that we can, so that we don't accidentally take a, a route which is not the most optimum. So we, if we're constantly adding points based on what we're discovering, we want to make sure that there's some sense in how we're actually approaching them. And that's just one of the partic particularities of this uh, algorithm is that we need to do that. We need to not so much sort it, but just make sure that we're always going with our lowest distance in terms of our path. So we don't take a, a route which is too long. And then what we want to do here, sorry, is hmm, We want to take whatever point is correct in terms of being the lowest index. So we take the count of it and we take the corresponding X and Y points. And I'm using pop here because what pop does is it returns the value of that index but also gets it rid of from gets it out of the list, deletes it um, as well as gives it to you. So this means we're managing our list with one command, we're getting the value we want and also removing it so we don't go over it more than once. And then we're gonna do our, um, we're gonna search our three by three neighborhood for possible bits of the path. So in our map T, these are where it's equal to zero. So this is our three by three neighborhood. So this goes from our Y, goes one back and essentially one forward, but you always index to the next value in Python. Yeah, this will give you a three by three grid centered on Y and X. And then we want to invalidate these points um, from future searches. By setting them in map T. So again, remember before we had to calibrate our image, I mean, doing that again here by adding y equals minus one, which is our start here. So this is in our path map. Um, going to set these values. Um, to not be zero anymore. And we could set them as a very high number as well. Um, so, yeah, it's not actually vital to set. It just has to be non zero. So, for example, we also want to set our yx value 
in the map T to be um, nothing as well. So we can set this to so just say large value, like this. And then we want to update our distance image. This is our sort of memory of what the distance was from our end point of our maze to where we started our computation from. So we use the same as before. And we're going to set this to CT but plus one. And so we found a load of coordinates. And we want to, so when we did this and found the zero points, these are valid path points. So we want to actually add these to our list. If you see it's X. I want to extend this with the same values. I could have defined these and just simplified it, but why not type it all out? It's not too much. So our Y points as well. That's it. So these are vectors of points. So for this, we've just got a single value, and it's going to be ct plus 1. But we want it to be the same length as the others, so I'm just going to do this. So this is a way of defining an array of this value of this length. It's like classic, classic kind of uh, Python list in a nomenclature. And then I want to set some ways of breaking out of this loop because at the moment it'll go on for um, ever. So if we run out of points, I don't want it just to keep going round trying to index empty lists. So if PTSX equals empty array because we've popped everything out, then I think we just just break and then the other thing is if we actually get to our start of our maze the the end of the path where we're trying to get to so again I'm going to do another um, Euclidean distance so y0 this time of our points Square it, and this time we are actually doing a comparison, which is our box R. So we want it if our point X gets so close to the origin that it's under our search radius, we use the same value as before. Then we want to capture that location. So, what were the actual values were? of our start point and then we want to break. So fingers crossed that it worked first time in those. Um, but what will tell us if it's worked or not is if we look at this distance image. No it didn't work. So Mr Bracket there. And put in an extra colon of forty four. Missed out equal sign, equivalent sign. Okay. Put in an extra bracket. Why is not defined? 
because I've got commas. CT is not defined. Oh, yeah, that should be CT, welcome to C. And yeah, great, so a few little bugs there. Hopefully it didn't disturb you too much. Um, and yeah, so here we've got it. So it's very faint here, but this represents the distance from the origin. So you see it gets brighter and brighter as the distance climbs. And you can see it explores all of the routes and obviously we just want one path, but this is sort of like the first path through. We've This is our breadth um, before depth search, our tree. So we are going down each path that we can. And then when we get to the end, which is here, then it's a case of tracing our route back, but always just going upstream. So as long as we always take the highest value within a three by three neighborhood, then it will take the most efficient route back. But let's put that to the test. What we have to do is come up with another way of basically walking up the path. Um, this time it's a bit simpler, uh, but it's very similar to before. So we want our now our path X. So this is what we're gonna, this is what we're gonna output. Ultimately, this is what we're after, our path from the origin of the maze to the end of the maze. And for convenience, I will just switch these over to X and Y. And then we're going to have another while loop, while true, which we'll have to break out of, of course. And then we're going to um, define our neighborhood. So our neighborhood equals now from our distance image it's going to be a neighborhood around our y next point this is very common during image processing lectures is to write a lot of algorithms for searching a neighborhood a three by three neighborhood in the practicals you'll get sick of, sick of it and then we want to set our center of our neighborhood to be some inescapable large value to negate it from further searches and we want to set all of the values um, which are negative in this case which represent the background also to be uh, very high because we're only searching around the path and the way I'm going to do it is by looking for the minimum point so I just want to make sure if it's zero it's background uh, it won't trigger this so um, yeah, so I also, I want a, a break pause here. It's just to say that if anything is, if all of the values are 999999, um, let's make sure I've got the right number of nines in both cases, then we want to break out. So this is if it's gone, something's gone wrong with the algorithm and it's got lost in a little island, hasn't managed to get back to the beginning, or the end of the maze even, then we want to just break out. So this stops the loop from running forever and the Jupyter Lab hanging hanging. So yeah, if we reach a dead end. And then we actually want to find the, the value of our minimum distance in our neighborhood. So we are making our way to the end of the matrix, of the maze even if we always do this. And then, yeah, we're gonna finally find the direction. So these are those meshes, meshes I made earlier. So based on the index, we want to correct where we're looking at using the displacements that we've got here. Our meshes, and then simple way of ending. It's another Euclidean distance. 
this time with x1. Again, yeah, we want this to be square rooted so that we can compare it to box R. And we'll just say with pride optimal root found. And then break out. And now path y appends our value. So what's my root found? No bugs, but let's put it to the test. So now we've got our root, we should be able to plot on our original image. So fix size. And we should have a nice root. I wonder if it's worked. Oh. We want a red line. Probably a bit thicker just so we can see it. How about that? So this looks like it has certainly worked. There's many routes it could have taken, but this looks like the most efficient route. Yeah, if it went down here. Yeah, it's just a dead end. So, fantastic. It looks like it has worked. So, remember what we did. First, we skeletonized it to get this sort of skeleton representation. And then, starting from the end, we tracked down all of the possibilities doing a breadth before depth search. And then, from our start point, we worked our way back, taking the, looking at the values that we'd saved and making sure that we took the lowest distance all the way back so we don't go down any dead ends and it's worked fantastic but let's try just one more quite complicated example and see if we can get that to work so this is this other image here which is a png so yeah this is a more tricky uh, representation and you'll notice that the start and the endpoint are in the wrong place so let's try something different yeah so we're going to start here and we're going to try and get to here be careful not to put your crosses or whatever on the walls itself. Probably won't work if you do that. So just make sure you're actually in the maze. And I'm going to take a look. Okay, so this is actually a PNG image with just one channel. It's an 8-bit rather than an RGB 8-bit image. So for the thresholding, we actually just want to remove that. But why don't we put in a nice little test? So if RGB image shape length so this is how many dimensions it has if it's more than two then we can use this approach so that the old method still works and otherwise we'll just do it as if it's one channel so and okay so the threshold here hasn't worked because i've got a feeling that this image is actually scaled between zero and one. Let's have a look. So image name, sorry, the image. So yeah, the maximum value is one already. So it actually is a thresholded image, but what I'll say is just a, a nice sort of compatibility issue, which means it will keep working with different examples is that we'll just say our threshold is halfway between the, the 
min and the max. So we just take the max value, or half the max, yeah. And yeah, that should work. It should work anyway, but I'll just make sure that that's the same. So yeah, now we get a nice binary representation. And yeah, I wonder if it'll just work. Optimum root found, fantastic. How about that? So there are many possibilities here. Could have gone all these different ways, but this to me looks like it is indeed a very good candidate for the most efficient route to the end. So there you go. That's a more efficient. Um, well, this 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 algorithm is, um, as far as I can tell, is guaranteed to give you the shortest route between the beginning and the end. So this is basically an example of a. Uh, undirected graph where there are many possibilities where you can go between the different nodes and through tracing our way through and then following the shortest route back we found the, um, the quickest way between two nodes of our graph essentially which we've defined as, as the beginning and the end and this will work even though there are areas where there's more than one possibility where there are, are loops and um, the implementation we have here is, is pretty fast I'm sure there are, there are better ways of um, doing it but this is this is good enough and yeah if you find any labyrinths or mazes where it's not working um, uh, as long as you've solved the initial getting it in the right format then um, please let me know all right I hope you enjoyed that and uh, all of the links and references uh, will be in the uh, description below. And I will make a link to the, the my GitHub where you can get this code and uh, links to the images as well. So I hope you enjoyed that and thank you very much.